Morning Talk with Sikkim Gabadeli. Sikkim Gabadeli. Looking at the effects of racism and inequality on humanity and society, we'll take your calls as well. Let me introduce you to my guest this morning, Professor Norman Duncan, who is lead, lead researcher of the Apartheid Archives and Dean of Humanities at the University of Pretoria. Professor David Fryer is Head of Research and an Academic and, of course, a Program Development within Psychology. Thank you so much to both of you for your time this morning. Thank you. It, it is a bit of a heavy topic, I suppose, for nine o'clock in the morning, but one that must be had uh, because of the impact that it has. And maybe, um, Professor Duncan, let me start with you and, and tell us a little bit about the work of the Apartheid Archives. The, uh, firstly, good morning to your listeners. The Apartheid Archive project was initiated in 2007, mm. um, and it really started following various incidents in South African society which had us quite puzzled, mm. one of them being the xenophobic violence yeah. um, of the late uh, 2007, uh, to, in late 2007 and 2008. And a number of researchers at the University of the Witwatersrand, where I was located at mm. the time, started thinking about why at that particular time did we have the emergence of such social disruption and mm. or disruptive events. Yeah. And I mean, in our discussions, it was very, very clear that the, the answer to the question could not be found in in contemporary South Africa at that point, but that had, had to be found in the past. I mm. mean, um, and we then thought that it might be opportune at that point to start looking at, at the, the past baggage that South Africans were carrying with them, um, which could po- potentially still have an impact on South African society. And we then decided, listen, we have seen the stories, the experience, uh, stories of the experiences of prominent people in South African society, but the people involved in, in engaging with one another on a daily basis, yeah. ordinary people. I mean, th- for them, there had been no process of yeah. resolution of what had happened in the past. And we then thought, let's start a project where we listen to people's past experiences, yeah. uh, particularly experiences prior to 1994, because very little about ordinary people's experiences are recorded in our history books. And so we have little data to make sense of ordinary people's interactions and, and mm. social group interactions in contemporary South, uh, South Africa. We then appealed to people to submit stories of, of, of that 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 um, emanated from South African society prior to 1994, and for people to tell us how they think those experiences impacted on their contemporary lives. Yeah. And we were surprised that the number of people came forward and gave stories, and yeah. really um, heart-wrenching stories, I mean, difficult stories. And people admitted that it was very difficult to tell those stories, yeah. but it was important to them. That's that's interesting. So you, you you didn't find it difficult to get people to come out and and, and talk because I suppose people want to talk. People definitely wanted to talk, yeah. and, and they, uh, let's face it, it was a difficult process for yeah. them, but nonetheless, they wanted to have their, their stories heard. And part of the project is, in fact, not only to allow people to speak about the experience, but to record it. Mm. In other words, to write about it. We're having a book published at the end of the year containing several people's stories yeah. of that period. And once again, it's the stories of ordinary folk. It's not the stories of the prominent academics and, yeah. um, and, and political leaders. Their stories are important, yes, but we also need to know to understand the texture of South African society, yeah. we need to hear what ordinary people experience. Whether they think that, that in fact, their experiences have been afforded any, any um, acknowledgement. Yeah. Um, and and that, that, that's why we basically have the project. And Professor Fryer, I mentioned uh, the, the word exclusion um, a, little bit, a little bit earlier. And I suppose what we're hearing from Professor Duncan is that when people feel included, when they feel heard, um, it's the beginning, I suppose, of a, of a healing process. Uh, yes. Uh, hello to you and he- hello to our listeners. And I would like to say what a privilege it is to be in South Africa and Cape Town at this really momentous conference. Mm. Uh, I think a huge international research literature um, suggests that exclusion um, is a a principal cause of of misery and um, when diverse and protracted can lead into psychological difficulties. Exclusion um, is often studied in relation to the labour market yeah. and particularly the impact of, of unemployment on people. That's very, very heavily researched now for about 80 years mm. um, around the world, although surprisingly relatively little research that I know of uh, in South Africa, which is surprising given the, given the high levels of given unemployment. The high levels of unemployment. Mm. But I think it's, it's really important. This um, S- South Africa is known in psychological circles for 
um, not only its its wider approach on psychology, but the impact of um, its studies in community psychology, yeah. and also what's called critical psychology, which is looking at the way in which psychological knowledge functions in, in the wider system. And um, it's inc really important, I think, the, the work that uh, Professor Duncan's doing to widen out our notion of exclusion from simply exclusion yes. from the labour market. And what are the effects of, of exclusion? What do, what do we see in communities and I suppose in individuals? Um, well, we see um, what we, I would call general mental health problems of, of anxiety and depression, mm. uh, of social isolation, obviously, um, poverty uh, in many cases, uh, inability to engage in um, the sorts of so social activities that require expenditure, mm. um, alienation of whole subgroups <coughs> uh, of the population um, who are positioned as being separate from or other than the population at large. And if you, if, you, if you look, for example, in South Africa, I think it was our former president, Thabo Mbeki, who said uh, that we have two South Africans, uh, obviously the first and the third world, living quite close to each other. The impact of that, where you are living literally a stone's throw from the most affluent um, you know, so, uh, uh, suburb, for example, um, you're seeing people driving these expensive cars, and you, as an individual, are struggling just to make ends meet on a day day-to-day -day basis that's got to have a huge impact on people yes I, th I think normally people who are involved in um, poverty research these days accept that relative poverty is a, a huge problem over and above the the impact of absolute poverty and um, there's actually now a very substantial international literature looking at inequality at a societal level it's been known for a very long time that in an unequal society those people who are lower down the um, the hierarchy uh, I get excluded from all sorts of normal social practices mm. and, and suffer uh, all sorts of social and psychological health problems. But what's really come out in, in recent, um, recent years, the last decade or, so, decade or so, is that the most healthy societies are not the richest societies. In, mm. a, in a society, the, the healthiest are often the richest, but the healthiest societies are not the richest, but they're the most, those with the most equitable distribution of income. Yeah. So um, even within quite rich societies, um, inequalities and sorts of comparisons that you're making between those that are excluded and those that are included uh, in activities can have huge huge impacts on everything from infant mortality yeah. to life expectancy to psychiatric hospitalization uh, and that's I think a really really important um, thing to understand. Professor Duncan, I'm almost afraid to ask how healthy we are, <laughs> because when I hear the list of things that Professor Fryer has just listed, it just says to me that we're not a very healthy nation. It would, I think it would be risky to make any definitive, um, or give any definitive answer to that. What Professor Fryer has indicated is that, that there seems to be, or there is, um, a dearth of, of research around the topic in South Africa. Mm. But I attended several presentations yesterday dealing with the issue of inequality and its impact on, on mental health. Mm. Um, the one by Isaac Pelotensky struck me as being particularly pertinent and, and, and uh, very, very informative. I mean, we clearly illustrated what uh, Professor Fry has just indicated, that, that we will have stark patterns of inequality, that that is a greater risk to, 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 to uh, mental health rather than for arguments sake, just absolute poverty. Um, absolute poverty certainly has an impact on mm. people's lives, but where people see the differences, yes. I mean, that I think they find much more difficult to en engage with. Certainly, I mean, we would be able to find an answer. I mean, there are indicators that, indi uh, that, yeah. that show that South African society is not all that healthy, but to, in order to get a definitive answer to your question, I think we would need to engage, as I think Professor Fry is, uh, is implying, we have to engage with uh, in thorough research and mm. there are several projects in fact taking off at the moment that will look at, at some of the indicators of inequality and to look at the impact that has on, 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 uh, on mental health in South Africa. You know, yeah. um, whenever we have a discussion on, on racism uh, on the station or on this show, I get the inevitable either call or SMS that says, well, you are fueling racism by talking about it. Why are we so afraid to talk about it? I suppose we... Of course, I do think that's nonsense, yeah. <laughs> just by uh, the way. In the project itself, we've had similar responses. Mm. I mean, we've had, I mean, for every hundred stories we've received, we've received about one story from a South African who says, enough of this now. Mm. 
apartheid is finished, stop talking about it. And I suppose from a psychological perspective, it's understandable. South Africans are very scared of looking at their past. I mean, we think that all the hurt and the difficulty and the trauma could just be washed away with yeah. the 1994 elections. And so we don't engage with that past. And yet, I mean, if you look at, at the research, that is such a, such a problematic thing to do for yourself yeah. as individuals. Yeah. Um, I mean, the way in which I think uh, racism plays itself out in South African society at the moment is through denial. We deny the existence of racism. Yeah. We even deny our past. And for psychologists, I mean, the first thing of a uh, uh, psychology one, a uh, first thing psychology student is taught is that you can start solving problems by acknowledging its existence. Yes. And yeah. so in South African society, we've been playing with, with denial. Yeah. And so we haven't in any concrete or systematic fashion engaged with, with that past. And that obviously closes off, us off to one another, which is really what the project is also about, mm. to get South Africans engaged with one another. But we can't engage in sincerity with one another if we refuse to hear each other's stories, yes. if we refuse to hear where the other person is coming from. Um, so yes, I'm sure that one of the callers is it's going, it's to, going call to happen. It's going to happen. I can, I can guarantee you. <laughs> I can guarantee you. Listen, let's stop about the past, think about the present, think about what's going wrong and move into the future. But the point is we can't understand the present if we do not take cognizance of what has happened mm. in the past. And, and so yes, people who, who say that we should not engage with them, I think they should call in and one can engage with them because that is what a new society is about, is about as well, yeah. to, to, to listen to all perspectives. I watch uh, uh, Professor Fryer with interest what's happening uh, globally with the, the, the global economic crisis because I think what it's done is to really open people's eyes to potential alternatives to the current system that we've been playing around with and would you agree with me that people who ordinarily don't have a voice um, in the third world are now getting um, a voice? I think um, I think that's so. I, th I think having a voice and less voice leads to change is a is an issue. Yeah. And also, when we have voice, we speak within a, a particular language or a particular discourse. And um, one of the themes at this conference is that um, the resources available to make sense of ourselves and our social world mm. can be um, quite constraining because there's such heavy pressure to understand ourselves in particular sorts of ways which um, don't necessarily connect up with social change. Mm. So having a voice is clearly important. More and more people are having a voice, but having a voice and being heard and that being heard and that having an impact and also having circumstances in which one can understand that the way in which we under understand ourselves and our social world can sometimes be part of the problem. Mm. So in Latin America, there's been a lot of work around what's called conscientization, which is um, about looking at the ways in which people who live with misery and hardship and social exclusion and poverty often blame themselves for it. And one of the encouraging things about uh, as we move into um, further into this century, I think, is the way in which people are resisting those um, ways of understanding themselves, mm. which actually position themselves as the problem. And um, that's one aspect of psychology that's really exciting and encouraging about this particular conference, because um, we're, we're engaging in critique of some of the ways in which psychology functions. Yeah. If I would just give you an example, yeah. um, unemployment has been demonstrated to be destructive for very many people. Uh, and I would qualify the earlier position that uh, Norman and I were talking about. Psychologists generally can make very good predictions about groups of people, mm. but within groups, individuals will respond differently. Yeah. So uh, in talking about an unhealthy society, um, that doesn't mean that all the people in that society will be unhealthy yeah. necessarily, of yeah. course. Um, but if you look at unemployment, um, studies which have followed large groups of people from employment into unemployment and measured all sorts of aspects of their mental and physical health show that that poor mental health is a consequence of them becoming unemployed. Mm. But if you look at the interventions which are developed, particularly in European countries, uh, they're often about working with the unemployed to change the way in which they relate to the labor market and to get them to look more assiduously for jobs. Mm. But in many countries, of course, the mismatch between the number of unemployed people and the number of vacancies is astronomical. Generally, 8, 10, 12 people um, looking for every single job. Yeah. So intervening into the individual and bringing about a psychological change um, isn't necessarily always a, a positive phenomenon. Yeah. And um, at this conference, what's happening is that people are looking at the way not only 
psychological research is done, but sometimes how psychological knowledge is misused by those that would reposition something like unemployment or mm. poverty as the fault of the person who is unemployed or poor. M misused in what way? Um, Blaming the unemployed person? Is um, I mean that the, the knowledge is misused yeah. to put the locus of intervention where change needs to happen yeah. within the individual psyche rather oh. than recognizing that the individual's uh, psyche or subjective state is a consequence of social and economic decisions that get made elsewhere. I um, is, is it a chicken and egg situation? <laughs> um, there's a chicken and egg situation in that unemployment can lead to distress and um, changes which make somebody perhaps less likely to look for work yeah. and um, more less attractive to an employer in some respects. Sometimes that's um, legitimate. More often there's a prejudice against people who've been unemployed for a period of time and uh, all research shows that long-term unemployed people are generally desperately keen to get jobs if only they can get them. So there's a chicken and egg in terms of whether unemployment causes poor mental health or poor mental health leads to unemployment. But there is no chicken and egg um, in psychology, as is not in medicine, in showing that um, many forms of psychological distress and mental health problems are not caused by um, the childhood or the personality of, mm. the, of the person, but by social conditions. You know, if you work in a factory which is full of dust without protection, you will get lung disease. Uh, if you yeah. w live in a society that's characterized by massive unemployment and, and, and relative poverty, the chances are that well, you are much more likely to um, suffer from a whole range of different um, illnesses and, and life expectancy. That, that's what research is telling us. Yeah. And yet, quite often, because people are doing research showing what the consequences of these broader social and economic arrangements are, yeah. um, yet at the same time, one sees um, media spokespeople and sometimes government people, not in South Africa, I'm talking about elsewhere in the world where yeah. I've worked, I don't know the situation here, but um, quite often the, the reason for the exclusion or the poverty or the unemployment is located in the behavior and personality of the unemployed person. So it's really important for, for psychologists both to engage in high quality research and show the consequences for psychological health mm. of the worlds we live in, yeah. but also to be alert to and to challenge when psychological arguments are deployed by others in order to if you like, make life even worse for the unemployed, poor and excluded, and to offer s interventions which cannot possibly work. You know, yeah. There is no possibility of solving unemployment by working on the unemployed, unless you're in an economy that's expanding hugely yeah. and there's large numbers of vacancies. And vacancies that people are skilled to actually get into, which is part of the, the problem in, in South Africa, is that we've got vacancies. We yeah. just don't have the skilled labor to fill those vacancies. Yes, I think, I think that's so. And, and also, um, what we're seeing is happening in South Africa. I know because I was reading the papers, we're seeing jobless growth. So there's, yeah. there's expansion without numbers of jobs being created. But more generally, and Norman and yourself might be able to, to tell me about this, but generally we're seeing a flexibilization of the labor market. So yeah. there are less permanent, full-time, trades union protected, high quality jobs. Um, more and more insecure, part-time, unprotected jobs being created. Many people are having to stitch together several part-time jobs in order to, to, to live or, to, or to, to meet their families. And research shows that job in, working in an insecure job or a highly stressful job is destructive, just as is unemployment and the sort of poverty and stigma that can come from unemployment. So for many people, they get trapped in a cycle of um, unemployment, poor quality, destructive new flexibilized employment, mm. periods of illness and recuperation, and uh, sometimes what are known as active labor market policies, which are schemes which are produced yeah. to um, help people to acquire the sorts, that in, in their terms, they're to acquire the skills that are needed to go back into the labor market. It might be about time structure mm. and, uh, and all of that sort of stuff. So I, mean, I, I regard these um, aspects of poverty and the labor market as being um, potentially creating a huge epidemic of um, not only misery but um, mental and physical health problems in a way that's that's really alarming and, yeah. and for that reason I think that um, psychology is a key discipline but it's also a risky discipline um, because it can be misused by those who are not engaged in the research or even sometimes by people who are. Mm. Um, hence the 
excitement of a conference like this that um, makes sure the voices of a whole range of, of people that are looking at psychological science and how it functions uh, in relation to serving the community or sometimes not serving the community gets yeah. gets addressed. So we've got almost that triple problem, Dr. Dr. Duncan, we've, mm. Professor Duncan, we've got the, uh, the, 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 the poverty, we've got the unemployment, we've got communities who are excluded and then on top of that we've got the racism. Yes, certainly. Um, I just want to, 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 to go, uh, I'll, I'll respond to, to, to the statement, but I just want to go back to something that David had said, which is, I think, quite important. You know, historically and traditionally, or traditionally in South Africa and th throughout the world, I mean, psychology has always focused on the problem of the individual. So, for argument's sake, in, in situations of high level of, of unemployment, mm. how the psychologist would intervene would be to look at the stress by the, by the individual and try to treat the individual for whatever symptoms he or she shows. The intervention would also be from some psychologists, I mean, how the intervention in terms of getting away from stress, how to, to prepare for an interview, how to yes. obtain a job. But that is not the problem, as Professor Fry had indicated, that if there's a dearth, if there's a scarcity of jobs, then obviously the problem has to be solved elsewhere. Mm. And what I find refreshing about, about the turn in psychology in South Africa is the fact that it's gone to look at problems, gone towards looking at problems in a much more holistic way, okay. and much more, um, and that's why I think um, community psychology in South Africa, um, of which uh, Professor Fry is a strong proponent, is, is, is gaining its strength in South Africa. And so I think that uh, in South Africa, and particularly community psychology, can play a more meaningful role, I think, in, in changing the conditions which lead to to, 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 uh, to, to psychological problems. Obviously, psychology can't do it on its own. Mm. Psychology plays a, a pivotal role in ensuring mental health, in, in, in monitoring mental health, but many of the problems have the origins elsewhere. They have the origins, uh, as you indicated earlier, in inequality, um, in, in um, pr certain practices in the labor market, which are just simply not conducive yeah. to, 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 to uh, um, a mental health. All right, I'm going to ask you to pause there for a moment. We'll pick up on the point that you're making and also maybe unpack what community psychology is and how it is um, being used in South Africa. And we're going to take calls as well on 0891104207, SMSs to 34701, Professor Norman Duncan and Professor David Fryer. I'll pick up with them in a moment. It's 25 minutes to 10. You're listening to SAFM, South Africa's news and information leader, coming to you live from the International Congress of Psychology at the Cape Town International Convention Centre and this morning talking about the effects of racism and inequality, exclusion, unemployment, poverty, all of those, the, the psychological effects on humanity and society. And we're taking calls on this one as well on 0891104207, SMSs 34701. In conversation with Professor Norman Duncan, who's lead researcher at the Apartheid Archives and also Dean of Humanities at the University of Pretoria, and Professor David Fryer is with the Australian Institute of Psychology and the University of Queensland as well. So let's take those calls. We'll take a couple of calls and then we'll get back to the issue of community psychology. Liz in Durban, good morning. Hi. I haven't got a lot to say, but it's just this. I think the government is actually fueling racism. I think in the fact that we're so far down the road, we're all trying to, just as the normal people on the ground, trying to make a, a, a better South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I just think with affirmative action for jobs, the quota system in, in, in sporting, especially at the school levels, you know, to make the provincial teams and things like that, I just think it's... it's, it's Wow, surely, and, and, and saying that there has to be so many women in a job and so many disabled and so many, surely the best person for the job, the best person for the position, that's where we should be at by now. We've, mm. we've, we've come a long way, but this seems to be a stumbling block, and I just don't see them letting up. All right. Thanks, Liz. We'll pick up on some of the points you're making there. Mary and Peter Maritzburg, morning. Yes, thank you very much for taking my call. I'm very interested in this psychology conference that is taking place in Cape Town. Mm. Um, having lived in this world for more than 90 years, my observation is that most of the problems of the world today are caused by overpopulation. 
Yet I hear not a word spoken about it until very, very recently, when I think our president stated that it would be wise for the population of South Africa, Africa to consider having fewer children, which I thought was a momentous statement. But I wonder why yeah. um, the psychologists, or if the psychologists could tell us why they are so frightened about men mentioning this problem, okay. which seems to me to cause unemployment, mm -hmm. not enough schools, not enough hospitals, not enough jobs. All our problems stem from overpopulation. I don't believe that the uneducated populations of the world um, mm. uh, 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 think about this. Okay. But I think a mammoth a world education of family planning should be um, started by perhaps the United Nations. Okay. To show people that having too many children is the cause of all of our problems. All right. I Thanks, would be Mary. grateful if yeah. the professor could tell me why yeah. nobody mentions this. All right, we'll talk about it. Thanks, Mary. Uh, Moosey in Durban, morning. Yes, hello. Morning. Yes, I'm, I'm so happy to listen to your program, especially Professor Fryer. I'm sure that uh, he has an experience as an academic uh, living in Australia and teaching in that university of an unequal society between the Aboriginal Australians and the white Australians. Mm. And if, if he can reflect on that as a, as a psychologist, as to how does he see the whole situation in South Africa after 1994, where the minority was in charge and the majority now are in charge. And even hearing some of the white uh, speakers, three or four, you can see that they are complaining about the changes. And yet the African majority are quiet, have not heard how many have called. Can he reflect on that? All right. Thanks, Missy. I'm going to take one more and then I'll give my guests a chance to respond and read some SMSs. Mike in Cape Town, good morning. Hi, good morning, Siggy. Thanks for taking my call. Can you hear me again? Okay? Yes, I can, Mike. Fantastic. Sorry, it's not in a great spot here. But you know, I just want to bounce something, something off your panel. Uh, you know, I, I mean, it's, it's, in a sense, it's kind of a personal observation, and I might be right or wrong, but I look forward to their comments. You know, I, I actually think that the race groups get on extremely well after 1994. We seem to get on extremely well. And the common denominator generally, I found, was, was doing business. You know, everybody wants to make a profit, and everybody wants to do business. And it doesn't matter who you do business with. You're not going to abuse or be racialistic or rude or whatever it is to the person, whoever you might be. If you're both going to benefit from the deal. And I found we were ticking along very nicely, thank you very much. Uh, I don't have any big hang-ups. I mean, I fought apartheid for, I don't know, wasted my time in, in hindsight now for 10 years fighting apartheid. So I haven't got a hang-up about colour. It doesn't really worry me. But I have, you know, I, like everybody else, want to make a few rand. And then what happens, and, what, and here's the comment I want to make on this, and I look forward to your panel's comment, is that the, the biggest problem in this country is, is, is not racism per se around the people, but... Our very own government is constantly playing the race card. Uh, you have to witness the situation yesterday where our president is now saying on, on TV or in radio interviews that, that uh, the problem that school books are not being delivered is because of apartheid. Apartheid goes to race, race goes to colour, and the next thing is the guy that I'm doing business with is now looking at me thinking, oh, this guy, Mark, you know, he's probably one of those old racists. And I'm looking at him thinking, you know what, this government's so corrupt, he's probably, he's probably got this deal because he's, he's, he's got some tender... A fraud going on, and I'm getting back to the situation where, you know, with a government that constantly plays the grace card to protect themselves from the, 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 the now massive corruption, mm -hmm. um, I think that's what's driving a wedge between races in this country. And I personally think if you could, if the government stopped playing the race card, which unfortunately mm -hmm. they can't, I think actually we'd live extremely harmlessly, yeah. and I don't think we'd be having many, you, many you, you don't race, think, so I don't think it would be necessary. You don't think, Mike, that we, or maybe you, I should say, are racializing corruption? Well, you know, look, they, yeah, not really, you know, because, I mean, the thing about the thing is we all want to make an honest living. And when I'm doing business with a guy who I know is going to take the money that I know he's in a position that he should not be there. He's only in a position there because he's a friend of a friend of a friend. And, you know, so the deal I'm doing with him is essentially telling me that he's spending my tax money incorrectly. Um, you know, he's, he's not there because he should be there. He's there because he's a friend of a friend. That in itself is... You know, is a problem for people like myself who just, I, I mean, I try and do an honest deal. And 
I'm constantly faced with this corruption. And all I'm saying really is, what it boils down to me is this. The mm. government has to play the race card. And I believe that if the government stopped, could stop playing the race card, and we'll agree that it, I think it will, it's a right. race card all the time. Take that away, and my previous country would be probably one of the most racial, harmonistic countries around. All right. I've got to ask my guests uh, to respond Thank to you. that. Thanks, Thank Mike. You. That's Mike in Cape Town. Two callers now, Liz in Durban mm. and Mike in Cape Town, uh, basically saying that it's the government that's fueling racism. Okay. Perhaps, perhaps I must start, start with an observation made by one of the speakers um, at, at yesterday's mm. uh, um, sessions. Um, I forget the name now, but I mean, she, she dealt with the issue of, of racism and just the way in which it continues to be maintained in contemporary society. Mm. And she says that the one way in which it's maintained is obviously through denial and, uh, um, and a refusal to engage with the, with the, with the problem. Um, I, I find, and, and, and one of the ways she says that this happens is through people immediately whipping out the accusation, you're playing the race card, mm. when you want to have an honest discussion about issues of race. Now, certainly there are multiple problems in South African society that have to be engaged yeah. with that, but I, I find it very really difficult when people try to avoid speaking about something that's critical for interpersonal, intergroup yeah. relations by tossing up whole lots of other contemporary problems, which certainly have to be attended to, yeah. but, but the one cannot avoid or obviate the discussion of, of the other. The SMS, I told you, would, well, it's like it's like Christmas. It comes around. It's consistent. Uh, it says, Siki, why do you always, uh, why do you always manage to have a program on racism? Black people are just as racist as whites. It's interesting. I did not say black on white racism or white on black racism. I just said racism. And then a, an assumption is made. Yeah. You see, and that's a, that is one of the enormous difficulties of, of South African society, that we refuse to engage honestly. And before we can even, even before the two of us can have mm. an on discussion, and, 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 and David with, with, with us, people tell us, actually, don't talk about it. Don't talk it. about uh, it. Yeah. Um, you, you, you're pulling out the race card to hide all types of other problems in South African society. And one wonders why the accusation get ma gets made. What other problems are we trying to cover by, by lobbying that accusation every time? Mm. Just in relation to, to the, the overpopulation issue, I found, found that uh, quite an interesting observation made by, I think it was Mary. It was Mary, yeah. Um, I mean, one needs to, to point out, obviously, that, that um, there's population growth in various parts of the world, but we also have an aging population in various parts of, of, of the world. And I think one of the problems that South Africa is going to face with, be faced with in years to come is an aging population, mm. where the majority of our population are, is going to become increasingly older. So I don't think it's, it's, it's the simple answer to say, cut down on the population and all the problems will be solved. I mean, David had, had quite clearly sh uh, shown us, I mean, w where all the other problems emanate. The issue around, around um, affirmative action I always find very interesting. How affirmative action is always just juxtaposed, or uh, it's placed in opposition to excellence, I yeah. mean, but the two go together. Yeah. Um, affirmative action, when you have, uh, employ affirmative action, you always take the best person for the job. I mean, and any, any, any uh, practitioner, personnel practitioner will tell you that, that that is pivotal. In any case, I mean, the, the, the caller said that perhaps we should stop with this affirmative action and get on with other things and, and, and try to be fair, fair about everything. But the reality of, this, of the situation is that less than 8% of the unemployed in South Africa are white. And the majority of the unemployed are black. So, so certainly affirmative action has, has, has not had meaningful impact on South African society. Yet, if we look at, 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 at how far, I come from a university environment, mm. who constitutes the top of the university, we still see the old racialized inequality. So certainly affirmative action um, is still not having a meaningful impact, not the, the, the extent of the impact that we, that we want to have. Certainly, we always have to question the modes of affirmative action. Yeah. I mean, how is, it, how is it affected? But that doesn't mean that we, that, we, that we cannot say that everyone who is appointed utilizing yeah. affirmative action processes does not does deserve is and is not the best person. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Professor Fryer? Uh, yes, I'd pick up first, uh, was call a Musi, I Musi, believe. Musi, yeah, um, about the Aborigines. Yes, um, it's probably obvious from my accent, but uh, I'm uh, a white Englishman um, who has been working in Australia now for uh, three and a half years, and um, I'm very respectful and and try to make sure that I'm perceived of as respectful to Aboriginal Australians mm. uh, who are of course a diverse group um, 
There are several things to be said. First, first of all, health and mental health problems are disproportionately huge amongst Aboriginal Australians. That's, that's clear. Um, and also it's clear that um, Aboriginal Australians suffer from all sorts of social exclusion, uh, poverty, increased rates of unemployment, uh, and also um, consequences of colonisation, which um, can destroy the structures of meanings that people have. At the same time, what's really interesting in psychology uh, and community psychology in particular is that uh, one of the most productive and fruitful levels of theoretical engagement around methods, research methods, uh, is now being offered by indigenous psychologists who are working through the implications of colonization uh, and the way in which whiteness, as we would call it, um, operates, often invisibly to yeah. the white person like myself, but nevertheless we have privilege um, which affects how we can understand the world in ourselves. Mm. So I would say indigenous Australians are a huge resource of wisdom and contributing massively to uh, psychological research. At the same time, the position of Aboriginal Australians um, is very problematic in terms of um, health outcomes and, and mental health outcomes, and that's, that's clearly an aspect of social injustice mm. uh, that needs to be engaged with. More generally, uh, unemployment is not distributed uh, randomly across the population, as Norman has Norman's referred to South African figures, but in all countries that I know, um, minority groups are always overrepresented in the unemployment figures. Mm. So that's definitely the case. Uh, as far as Mary is concerned, I, I would agree with Mary that uh, there is a problem, particularly in relation to unemployment, of a, a mismatch between the number of people and the number of vacancies. Yeah. Of course, that can be addressed um, by increasing the number of vacancies or it can be addressed uh, in terms of um, the number of people. Actually, Australia is a uh, a country that's still underpopulated in some respects and is taking huge strides in order to encourage more people to migrate to fill, fill jobs. Yeah. Um, though Australia is a pretty exceptional amongst the OECD countries in, in actually having low unemployment yeah. and, and being in economic boom, partly because of its provision of uh, mineral resources to China, which is a, a huge boost to the Australian um, economy. Um, I, I think that's the, what I would have to say. Two. All right, let me read some SMSs sent through 234701. Someone says, the sooner subsidies by government are stopped, and then it just ends there, all right. Elliot and Whitbank says, beneficiaries of centuries of deprivation have the audacity to tell the dispossessed to strap up and move on. Uh, James says, everyone is born equal, have the whites got more brains because they've been successful. Jeez, James, I don't even know how to <laughs> where to begin with that <laughs> statement. <laughs> Wahid in Cape Town says overpopulation may be seen as a problem but it must be understood that many people see children as a form of security for the future and uh, another one says explain why white people would rather be in their own communities as opposed to mixed communities that's Charles and another one, another one says just think of all the good that could have been done with the billions squandered and disappeared in a black hole in the past 18 years and another one says I'm unemployed and are straight up mentally strong because I study clowns every day. I'm rich with skills. What vacancies have you got for me? You study clowns. Okay. Yeah, ne? Here's another one that says, Why is everybody not saying a thing about what Indians are doing to blacks? It is shocking. I don't know who silenced Mbongeni Ngema. I mean, we all know what happened with that song and the debate that was generated with that. And um, is it Sam Muloy in Soweto says, Siki, after President Zuma, all racists in South Africa will know their fate when the real government of black people takes over. Okay, Sam, <laughs> we'll wait for that. Let's hear from Ernest in Gwangwanase. Morning. Morning, Sheik. How are you? I think I'm okay. <laughs> yeah. I have Morning. moments. I have moments. Hi. My, my two thoughts. Mm. There's two major problems in this country, and everything devolves around from it. Mm. There's not enough employers and there's not enough taxpayers. Mm. Everything's a budget issue. There's an unemployment issue. It comes down to there's not enough employers and there's not enough taxpayers. And it doesn't matter what sex they are, what age they are, what race group they are, yeah. what their background was, they're just not enough employers. Okay. All right. That's so we're talking about yeah. too many unemployed. We should be addressing the core. 
too few employers, too few taxpayers. Okay. Thanks, Ernest. I was saying, we'll chat about it. with some students the other day. And yeah. The university compromised this. I said, yeah, so what are you doing about it? I said, you're not addressing the core. Mm. I said, the core is not enough taxpayers. So the university can't get enough money from the government. Okay. to do X, Y, and Z for you. It that sounds very simple. It sounds a little bit oversimplistic to me, Ernest. Well, be, yeah. beyond that simpli be below that simplicity, yeah. there's all the dynamics, yes. Employers have their businesses. Most businesses have issues. They have yeah. hardworking staff and lazy staff and honest staff and dishonest staff and good marketing and bad business plans and good yeah. all that forth. But basically, there's not enough employers. Okay. Let me hear and what so the professors say. millions, yeah. and then you get... It sort us down to, to, the, to too, many, too much pressure on the educational institutions because there's no exit from grade 12 when you matriculate. Mm. You can't then decide, I'm going to get a job and study further. Yeah. So you go and you put pressure on the university to admit you because there's no exit strategy. Okay. You can't get a job, so you say, okay, well, I'll try and study further. All right. Thanks, Ernest. I've got Am to move I on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got to move on. I'm sorry, Ernest. Ivan in Joburg. Hi, Ivan. Good morning, Sugi. Hi. Yes, good morning. I just wanted to comment. I mean, I've been listening, um, driving. And, yeah. uh, I hope you've stopped. You're not uh, breaking yeah. the law. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think uh, my, my first issue is that I, I, I would have thought that the psychological conference that you've been talking about mm. have just gone beyond of embarking on coping mechanism in the case of South Africa. I, I would have wished that they would have appreciated that our problems are compounding as a result of the failure of all of us as a country to have changed the structure of South African economy and ensure that the majority of the people of this country can have equal access. And I want to argue that listening to, to callers, yeah. I want to argue that I think it is becoming so glaring this past 18 years that unfortunately our counterparts, our white, uh, you know, uh, South Africans have become sick. They, they, they have got absolutely no tolerance or they don't want us to talk about the real fundamental cause of the issues that relate. I mean, you take their posture on a simple thing mm. called corruption, yeah. they, they, they take a particular stance that is basically, look, the ANC government is, is corrupt and so forth. It is government. If government says, look, let's address issues of demographics, yeah. this government is fueling racism. These people, I mean, go to blogs and say yeah. something about what must be done fundamentally to make sure that people of this country are, are equal um, in yeah. terms of the economy. Go read the blogs, what they say, the things they say that okay. unfortunately reflect the very sick society. All right. That is racist. Okay. Thanks, Ivan. I've got Pam and Dorothy on the line. I'm going to ask them to be as brief as possible because we've got about five minutes left and I've got to wrap up uh, with my professors as well. Pam in Cape Town, morning. Uh, morning, Ziggy, and to your panel. Mm. I first of all want to refute the overpopulation problem. Mm. I think one of our major problems, first of all, race and class has fallen in, in South Africa together. Mm. And the working class, I would say, hasn't benefited from our new democracy to a large degree. First of all, I heard econ economists recently saying how much multinational uh, corporations yeah. have amassed a huge amount of cash, and they're not yeah, spending it. and it's not being spent, yeah. And we're not having a redistribution. I mean, I've benefited from the car train, but the train was empty and the buses were empty. Yeah. I think that money could have gone to housing, to sanitation, to water, to giving hope, to, to um, giving apprenticeships to young black people. Mm. I mean, we know that the ages of the unemployed are mainly young black people. Um, the World Soccer Cup was fabulous yeah. for one day, but, but we're still paying yeah. for it as ratepayers and taxpayers. Yeah. So our money could have gone to other things. And I think yeah. just the World Cup would have provided water and sanitation for the whole of the country. Yeah, so that so speaks I to priorities. Our economic mm. policies need to kind of make a shift. Okay. Thanks, Pam. And final call, Dorothy in Cape Town. Please be brief, Dorothy. Thank you. Um, I wonder how your uh, panel feel about this. Now, people who train to be psychologists, 
uh, train in, in psychometric measuring and in the private sector to get a job you normally have to go through a battery of tests. When the new government came in, mm. one of the first things they did was to do away with certain tests. Maybe that had to do with affirmative action, but I'm not discussing that at all. I agree with the affirmative action, but the point is people in high power position in government who, who, who affect the lives of every single yeah. person, uh, I feel that in, 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 I don't know what happens in other countries, that they should have psychometric, be measured psychometrically, not just whether they're fit for academically for the job, but character and personality, but mostly character. I mean, when we see how much money's been stolen and squandered, mm. um, I mean, that, that has affected people and especially poor people in this okay. country, and I wonder how your panel feels about that. All right. Thanks, Thank Dorothy. You. Bye. Okay, bye. Bye. That's Dorothy in Cape Town. I'll start with you, uh, Professor Duncan. Uh, I think that, that um, the people in government who had deliberated about the usefulness of psychometric testing had made fairly wise decisions. Mm. I mean, a number of those tests were highly problematic and they did not tell us much. Um, uh, I, I still am not a very strong proponent of uh, psychometric testing. Very, very frequently, it uh, it privileges certain groups. I mean, most most uh, most uh, uh, frequently, the dominant groups in any society, the dominant culture within any society. I mean, there the, the are old arguments and old debates which show that I mean, uh, certain items are are, are, are easier identifiable. If you look at at at, at, at um, testing for for, for, for for mental ability, yeah. uh, that that privilege people who, who have access to certain cultural resources and not. Yeah. So, so by its very nature, certain psychometric testing uh, or psychometric tests are, are unfair. Of course, lots of progress have been made since 1994 in improving those tests and making them more, more, more predictive, uh, predictive um, of certain attributes that individuals have. But I still am, am, am somewhat cautious about the, the gratuitous and easy use of psychometric testing. So is this conference going beyond just dealing with coping mechanisms? Oh, yes. was a question uh, that oh, I've yeah. Oh, yes. I mean, I, I think this... For the first time, and I'd been at the previous conference in Berlin, and for the first time, I think, as, as, as David has indicated, uh, that at least here it's, very, it's much more pronounced than yeah. had been the case the previous time, we're dealing with social issues. We'd, certainly, we're dealing with individual issues. I mean, and these are critical. Mm. Um, clinical psychology issues, therapy issues, etc. But we're also dealing with various other critical issues, uh, issues related to power, issues related to race. I mean, we've just heard now yeah. how difficult it is for people to talk about yeah. race. And those are some of the issues that we're discussing here. So I am... I'm I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed by the, just the range of, of topics that were discussed. And it shows us yeah. that psychology, is not only in South Africa's coming of age, but to a certain extent, it has set a new trajectory for itself globally, given the presentations at this conference. Let me give Professor Fire a final uh, word. Okay, I'd pick up on the comment by Ernest and one by Pam, I think. Yeah. Um, as regards not enough employers, as we've heard, um, we've got jobless growth. We've got employers who are moving their labor requirements around the globe in order to find the cheapest possible. Mm. Uh, employees. Um, we've got employers hunting cheap labour wherever they can find it. So I think there's a problem there. As far as not enough taxpayers is concerned, um, I, I understand that point. And I think that when people become unemployed or they're, they're socially marginalised, they're not paying taxes. But also the costs of um, these, the impacts of social policies um, on community destruction and on individual health are absolutely massive. Uh, I was really pleased to hear Pam mention class. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's quite unfashionable these days to, to talk in terms of class. Um, the inequality literature that we started talking about right at the beginning is very clear that whether you actually use old-fashioned notions of class, whether you use mm. registrar general classification, whether you use educational level, whether you look, use levels of uh, poverty and use of car, um, there is clearly a class structuring. Um, which is going on, which cuts across other, other differences. So I, I think that's hugely valuable to get that mentioned. And uh, although class, I've not heard class discuss, discussed a lot at this conference, um. Um, it seems to me that um, it's there yeah. in, in a sense. Um, we, we understand that groups of people are disadvantaged by their group, group yeah. basis. Yeah. And I mean, she really was also talking about prioritization, but unfortunately we're out of time. It's been fantastic talking to both of you this morning. My pleasure. Thank you very much Thank indeed. You very Thank much. you. Professor Norman Duncan and Professor David Fryer and Professor David Fryer and Professor David Fryer and Professor David Fryer.